He has marked them. Praise the Lord. Your dear friend, Paul Kane, they were actually quite close in the last year. But the first time he came here, he stopped me in the parking lot. We're coming in. He stopped. He said, I see a sign, Joel's Army in training in this building. Yeah. And so I find it interesting that you're talking about Joel too and Joel's Army because that was the first word he had when he came on the property for the people here. Among the people living in the world today, there exists a group who consider themselves to be the elite, the chosen ones, given power and authority by God to take dominion over all others. Tasked with preparing for a spiritual war, these people are instructed by their spiritual leaders to embed themselves in society, hidden in plain sight, to recruit new soldiers for an end of days battle, they believe, will happen at any moment. This covert religious military is given orders to invade seven areas of society, some of which exist in the realm outside of church influence. The operation by this army, given code name, Joel's army, is to subdue and claim dominion over family, religion, education, media, arts and entertainment, business and government. The objective is to grow the army until it overpowers outsiders, which might object to the world views of the network of paramilitary religious operatives. How did this covert religious military strategy begin? Who created the operation for Joel's army? How can these covert operatives be identified among people in today's society? To answer these questions, we must examine a little-known history that began when the early healing revivals of the late 1940s merged with a very militant movement known as Christian Identity. Though they lunge between the weapons, they're not cut down. What? The Lord gives voice, an alarm, a sound, before his army, for his camp is very great. Notice it says this is the Lord's They're army. Walk in the fullness, every power of every till in time is broken, and they enter into the fullness of the greater works. And the Lord's voice is what awakens this supernatural army. There's it's going to be a remnant who are going to join this Joel's army, this in time army. When modern Pentecostalism was formed, Pentecostals leaned heavily upon an Old Testament prophecy from Joel 2, which described the spring and autumn rains for crops. These rains, bringing an end to a famine, were referred to in Joel as the former and latter rain. Leaders of the Pentecostal movement saw their revival as a fulfillment of the combination of Joel 2 from the Old Testament and Acts 2 from the New Testament, which described the biblical day of Pentecost. For Pentecostals, the Ezusa Street Revival was the latter reign, to the former reign allegedly described in Acts 2. Under the framework of British Israelism, wherein the United States and Canada were believed to be nations of one of the lost tribes of Israel, Joel's prophecy could be multipurposed for a dual meaning. By the late 1940s, British Israelism had transformed. Organizations such as Howard Rand's Anglo-Saxon Federation, and Joel Burton Winrod's defenders of the Christian faith had introduced militant and anti-Semitic extremism into the British Israel theory. Both groups helped distribute the anti-Semitic publication, Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, which claimed that the so-called false Jews were the masterminds behind a plot to overthrow several mountains in the NAR's Seven Mountain Mandate. Several key figures in NAR history were leaders in these militant organizations. Charles Fuller, founder of the Fuller Theological Seminary where NAR founder C. Peter Wagner taught, was a member of the Defenders. Gerald Burton Winrod, whose anti-Semitic and anti-government agenda landed him in prison during the Great Sedition Trial of 1944, worked with Amy Simple McPherson. His work in the Foursquare organization occurred during the years leading up to Foursquare leaders organizing the Sharon Orphanage that birthed the latter Rain movement. Gordon Lindsay, who launched countless ministries in NAR history, was a very active speaker in the militant Christian identity movement. This movement, based on anti-Semitism and white supremacy, birthed Joel's army. Now I'm with Paul Kane now. It's 1987 is when I met him here. 
They talked about Joel's army and training. It's 88. It's 89. It's 90. Me and Paul and Jack there. We're traveling with Wimber. We're having a great time. We're all around the world together. It's, you know, John is moving in signs and wonders. Uh, Paul Cain is prophesying, you know, her words of knowledge. Jack Deere, one of the best teachers in the body of Christ. And my role is, they said, Mike, just tell stories. When the latter rain revival broke out at the Sharon Orphanage, these militant themes merged with Pentecostal doctrine to create a new breed of Pentecostal. The group decided to combine Christian identity with Joel II, repurposing that chapter to apply to an army of so-called spiritual warriors. As the movement edged closer to extremism, they began referring to their Pentecostal extremism as Joel's army. Building upon themes from the Azusa Street Revival, the latter rain revivalists used the former and latter rain concept from Joel's prophecy to link the two revivals. However, because of Christian identity, there was one significant emphasis. In Joel's prophecy concerning the end of a famine, caused by a plague of crawling bugs, Joel described God's use of the bugs with the word, army. Certain latter rain revivalists, not understanding this word to be metaphorically used to describe a curse, misinterpreted it as a description of the latter rain converts. I will restore unto you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar, the polymer worm and caterpillar, the great army which I sent among you. Combined with one single verse, taken out of context from Romans 8 verse 19, the group believed that they were this army, the manifested sons of God. The open vision of the stadiums that Paul Cain had, where they're up on the, he saw this, he claims, I mean, it might just be a generic round number, I don't think it's an actual number, but he said 100 times over 30 years I saw this vision. It was his primary vision, they told everywhere he went nearly. And that and the God's raising up Joel's army, those are the two things he said continually. By the mid-1950s, the latter rain movement was denounced by many Christian leaders as heretical and destructive. The manifested sons of God aspect of Joel's army had shifted Pentecostalism towards authoritarian control. Latter rain leaders began to include Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 in their militant form of Christianity, pushing the idea that apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers were to be viewed much like military ranks, with self-declared apostles as generals. Even the assemblies of God, who were largely responsible for spreading latter rain, declared the movement to be apostasy. Certain rogue ministers, both within the assemblies of God and in other sects, after experiencing its power, could not abandon the destructive Joel's army theology. Even as infamous cult leaders like Jim Jones of People's Temple, whose sect would later commit mass suicide in Jonestown, Guyana, became involved, these authoritarian figures remained loyal to William Branham and other leaders of the Joel's army faction. Among those who remained loyal to Branham was Reverend Paul Kane, who would not only be instrumental in organizing many revivals and movements in the history of the NAR, but also become a leading teacher of the Joel's army theology. It was Kane who convinced International House of Prayer leader Mike Bickle that his organization would be given superhuman powers if they joined Joel's army and began recruiting spiritual warriors to invade governmental and social systems. Even after NAR leaders were exposed by the Southern Poverty Law Center, a watchdog organization advocating for civil rights against Christian identity and white supremacy, the NAR chose to remain loyal to Joel's army extremism and continued to promote the manifested sons of God theology. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing, Lord. We thank you for your nearness. We thank you that you have invited us in. So Jesus, I pray that you would raise up a Joel's army from the Gen Z, Lord, those who are willing to stand with Israel, that will partner with your promises, Lord. Joel's army, militant Christian extremists birthed by Christian identity leaders in the late 1940s, still exists today. Though leaders of the NAR have concealed the history of the movement from its members, their reverence for generals in that army today is a clear sign of their allegiance. Key figures in the Christian identity sect are worshipped as God's generals within the NAR, 
And with each new generation that emerges, a new generation of generals devoted to the cause continues to rise. Will they be successful in their mission? Will Joel's army overthrow the current world order and establish their dominion over non-members? Unless the world becomes aware of their mission, Joel's army will continue to invade. Lord, we thank you for this 40-day period that it's coming to, it's come to an end and, and you've touched us in a special way tonight. And you've said yet again, Joel's army is in training, even in this building, and we thank you for that. We ask you in Jesus' name, amen and amen.